Hi, I'm Annie Fitzsimmons. I'm your Washington Realtors Legal Hotline Lawyer. And today's video is part two in the Home Sale Contingency video series, Form 22B. We left off with our theoretical discussion about why a seller might want to enter a home sale contingency addendum. And so today let's talk about what happens in Form 22B, assuming that the buyer and seller actually decide to move forward with the home sale contingency addendum. Paragraph one okay. controls what the buyer is required to do with respect to listing their property. Anything in particular we need to know? Well, absolutely. Uh, if the property is not on the market, listing agents, sellers, uh, you have a time limit to where you have to get that house on the market. And when I say on the market, the form explains just what that means. And that means in the MLS, by a licensed firm uh, and in an MLS servicing that area, that's on the market. And the default time period is five days, right? Is that, a, is that a time period that you can write in or is that a fixed five days? The five days is printed in the provisions. Okay, so it's not by default. It's actually, you got five days yeah, to get Yeah, five listed. days. Okay, so the buyer who has agreed to purchase the seller's property under a home sale contingency, once the seller agrees to that, buyer then has five days from the date of mutual acceptance with the seller to get the buyer's property listed for sale with an with a member of the MLS in the servicing the area where the buyer's property is located. Yes, if it's not already on the market. Sometimes it's already on the market, it just hasn't sold yet. Okay, all right. Anything else about paragraph one of Form 22B that's important? You know, here's a question I get sometimes, and I think that this is just worthy of at least discussing. Question is, what keeps a buyer from taking the house off the market? There's a requirement that the buyer put the house on the market, but nothing says the buyer has to keep the house on the market. <laughs> That's a trick question because I've never told you I was going to ask yeah, you that. Yeah, thank you so much, Annie, for this opportunity. <laughs> so here's how I would answer that okay. question. I would say that every party to a contract has an implied duty of good faith. I, I was going to say that doesn't seem like good faith to me, but I was trying to remember if good faith was in the language. Even better. It's just a matter of contract law. Every every party to a contract has a duty of an implied duty of good faith, and the terms of the home sale contingency agreement create an obligation on the buyer to keep their home marketed on the MLS during the duration yeah, of the home sale contingency sense. addendum, right? Good. Okay, so that's paragraph one. Any, I'm sorry, anything else on paragraph one? Uh, no, just get the house on the market if it's not on the market. Okay. Paragraph two is critically important. Buyer brokers, for you to understand, that's a true statement whether you also are the buyer's listing broker or not. Buyer brokers, you, paragraph two of Form 22B can sink your buyer dead in yep. the water. Yep. So who, do you want to explain or you want me to? Uh, well, we both can, but more than just sink the, the buyer, I think it can sink the licensee who helped enter into that okay. contract. All right, go that ahead, That doesn't meet the terms of paragraph two. So paragraph two, as Annie said, is pretty huge. Uh, there's two types of transactions where you would need the seller, when I say seller, the seller of the subject house, that buyer wants to buy, there it go again. But there are two types of transactions where you would need seller's permission before entering into this transaction on the contingent house. And paragraph two outlines those. And one of the um, scenarios is if the close date on the contingent house is uh, less than 30 or more than 60 days out before entering into that contract, you need to get seller's permission, seller on that subject house, their permission before entering into this contract. And I always ask the question, well, why? I don't know if you want to go there yet. Well, we okay. just did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say that uh, we have a uh, a, a cash buyer who wants to close in 15 days and we enter into an agreement on the contingent house closing in 15 days. I always ask, Annie, how does it impact my seller on the subject house and why should we need seller's permission? Because, because the closing date of the seller's property, and I, I, I like to I'm going to explain it this way. You do this, and I do, yeah. Yeah. So in this in this 
Form 22B transaction, we've got two transactions going. We've got seller selling to buyer, and we've got buyer selling to buyer's broker. And so the closing date of this transaction, buyer to buyer's broker, creates the closing date in the seller selling to buyer transaction. So if, as Ken just explained, we had a 15-day close on this transaction, Form 22B says that this transaction then close, closes three days later. Yes. So we, so the form says that buyer selling to buyer's buyer can't close in less than 30 or more than 60 days because we don't want to force the seller to close super fast and we don't want to stretch them out forever either. So that's why this 30 to 60 day window right. is created. So if, and this is, this is critical buyer brokers, if buyer sells to buyer's broker and has a closing date that's less than 30 or more than 60 days without first getting seller's permission. It's not okay to come back. Well, I mean, it might turn out okay in your transaction, but the form does not allow you to enter this, to enter this agreement and then get seller's permission. Before you enter this agreement, you've got to go get seller's permission or what? Well, so first I want to say that's why it matters to the seller because clearly we would need seller's permission that they're closing in 18 days if we're closing 15 plus three. Right. If you do enter into that contract and you did not get seller's permission to answer Annie's question, seller has the choice of either now terminating the contract on, uh, on their subject house, terminating that and being entitled to the earnest money or seller could continue with the contract, but they could terminate. And what would that do to this buyer who is now under contract on their house and seller just terminated this house. It means they're homeless. Well, the buyers aren't gonna have a house. Right. Huge, huge. Huge consequences. And so buyer broker, and, and we've got another layer of this yes. that we'll also add to in, in a minute, but buyer broker, this is where I think your job is the most difficult because it, if you are the both the buyer broker on this transaction and the listing broker on this transaction, then hopefully you keep all these balls in the air and you make sure that the closing date is the right time period. Um, but where it gets really complicated is let's say that that buyer's property, this property is back in North Carolina. And now you've got a, a listing broker back in North Carolina that you have to communicate with regularly yep. To make sure they understand how absolutely critically important this is. This isn't just a something you're hoping for. This is a contract term that limits the buyer on this end. And if that listing broker in North Carolina messes this up, then their seller, your buyer, could be homeless. And the seller in this transaction, as Ken said, either gets to keep the earnest money or has whatever other remedy provision is identified on the face of Form 21. This, the, the, it is as though the buyer has breached the contract. That's the, that's the remedy that the seller gets is because the buyer has effectively breached the contract, even though seller is the one who ends up terminating. So Annie, what do you think of this? If, if I am dealing with a listing agent in North Carolina on the buyer's contingent home, and I am now explaining to that listing agent in North Carolina, paragraph two, and the consequences of not following paragraph two, that I am going to have that conversation documented and have it as material communication in my oh. file. I like that. I, yeah, I like it too, in case that does happen. Yeah, and, and I would do it one step further. I would make sure that the buyer knows that same conversation because it's yes. one thing to trust the listing broker on the other end, but, but that buyer is ultimately going to have to sign any purchase and sale agreement with us, with this buyer for the North Carolina home. So make sure we've empowered the buyer with the same knowledge. Love it. Yeah, and the listing broker as well. Okay, so we've got this okay. other criti yeah, really yeah. critical component that we haven't mentioned yet. And I, when I teach this, I always loop them together, and I know you do too, so I'm not sure why we've separated them out. I hope that doesn't distract any of you. Because paragraph two requires the buyer to get seller's permission, not only for the closing date provision, but also... Yes, the other, the other uh, scenario that we need seller's permission on is if first. the, yes, first to get the permission, is if the sale of the contingent house, I, and I can't, because I do it differently, the sale of the contingent house, that buyer has to sell a house to buy this house. So either a home sale contingency 
or a pending sale contingency. We need seller's permission. So, so to nutshell it, yes. if the sale of this house, buyer to buyer buyer, has a closing date of less than 30 or more than 60 days, or a pending sale or home sale contingency addendum, then this buyer must get seller's permission before this buyer can enter the purchase and sale agreement with buyer's buyer. Is that right? Right on. Okay. Otherwise, the same, we talked about same the consequences consequence. for the closing date, it's exactly the same if, if buyer enters an agreement with buyer's buyer for a home sale or a pending sale contingency without seller's permission. Yeah. And it's spelled out pretty clearly in paragraph two, uh, folks. So really look at paragraph two and just digest it. It's, it's right there. Okay. Now you did a really good job a second ago of cross-pollinating this discussion with material correspondence, mm -hmm. I want to cross-pollinate this discussion with Form 22EF. Okay, okay. <coughs> Go. Okay, the 22EF evidence of funds. So there are, sometimes you'll see where as a listing agent, you'll get an offer and you'll have the 22B, you'll also have a 22EF evidence of funds. And when this happens, because it, it, it's happened to me and it will happen to you. Um, I think the best way, well, first to understand that if we're using the 22 or if the buyer broker is using the 22 EF for the same, as you put it, the same money as the 22 B, like I'm giving you an EF to, to, to disclose that I need the money from the sale of my buyer's house to buy your house, that's the same money. We don't want to have a B and a 22 EF at the same time. And when that happens, just, I think a good question, you would ask that buyer broker who gave you the B and the EF and the same offer, hey buyer broker, let's say your buyer is unable to close on their contingent house, what happens to the earnest money? Who gets it? Under the 22B, the expectation of the buyer is that the, bu is that the buyer gets the earnest yes. money, right? And and if that same money were accounted for under the 22EF and the buyer is unable to get the money That's from the right. sale of the property, what happens? Paragraph four says that the seller is entitled to the money that buyer has defaulted. Those are conflicting <laughs> terms. Yeah. So I, when I teach forms classes, I always say that the, that the a buyer and a, or a listing broker and a selling agent, both when you're, when you're considering the terms of an offer, you have to know the form so well that you understand the totality of the offer. You can't, you can never view a transaction form by form, addendum by addendum. You have to consider the totality of the, of the purchase and sale agreement. And this is a situation where Ken is exactly right. If you have a 22B and a 22EF that both account for the exact same funds, you got a conflict in terms that's irreconcilable at some level. So um, just to back up one second, I want to make sure everybody who's watching the video knows what a 22EF is. Okay. The evidence of funds addendum. It's a, it's a critical addendum to be included in a transaction, in, in most transactions. And the reason why, no, I'm going to take you backwards in time. We're really cross-pollinating now. Going. Form 21, paragraph A, says that the buyer is not relying on a contingent source of funds unless otherwise disclosed in the purchase and sale agreement. And so if the buyer is relying on funds from the sale of their home, those, those are contingent funds, yes, correct? Yes, absolutely. And in, in the instruction of this video, we're contemplating that the buyer has used a Form 22B to account for those contingent yes. funds, right? Um, let's say that the funds weren't coming from the sale of property. Let's say they were coming as a gift from grandma. That would be when a buyer, for example, would use the 22EF, the evidence of funds addendum, and the evidence of funds addendum it gives a definition in that top paragraph between the difference between contingent and non-contingent funds. Now here's buyer broker, as we're talking about Form 22B, here's what you need to understand. It, it's true that the home sale contingent funds, just like the gift from grandma, are both contingent funds. But if you read the definition on Form 22 EF of contingent funds, that definition carves out funds that are already subject to a 22B, a 22Q, the pending sale contingency, a Form 22A financing contingency. So if you've got funds that are, that are in fact contingent funds, 
it's it's proper that the buyer account for them, but if they've already accounted for those funds with the with the inclusion of a 22A, 22B, or 22Q, right. they don't have to account for those funds again on the 22EF, and to do so would be improper. They've already disclosed it. So can you contemplate a scenario where a buyer might properly include both a 22B and a 22EF in the transaction? Well, you mentioned grandma's gift funds. Mm -hmm. So what if I what if I also need gift funds from grandma uh, in addition to selling my house uh, to close? There you go. Those are contingent funds. Again, paragraph A in 21 requires I disclose that. Right. And paragraph 3 in 22EF would be the proper place to disclose grandma's gift funds. Okay. So the only time you're going to have both a 22B and a 22EF in the same transaction is when the 22EF is dealing with some funds other than the funds that are subject to the 22B home sale transaction. Different money. Right. And to really go a little bit astray here, the 22EF is also used to, to prove that buyer owns non-contingent funds. So you could include a 22EF and mark box number two, which is non-contingent funds, just to show that you're going to provide proof of those funds and include a 22B to account for the funds that are coming from the buyer's home sale contingency. Yeah, paragraph two is a show me the money paragraph. Okay. All right. Yeah. That was, that was a, um, a far stretch from 22B, but that issue is critical because I see buyer brokers make that mistake all the time where a 22B and a 22EF gets included to cover the same money. That's right. And yeah. just, just ask the question that I shared. That's a non-confrontational uh, way to get to the bottom of the problem with doing that with the cross-sale agent. The question being, what, <clears throat> what is your What happens to the earnest money? Yeah. Yeah. Because... Self-discovery. You're leading them to self-discovery. There you go. And when you say them, you mean the broker on the other side the of the The other transaction. side, the cross-sale agent. Okay. Good. Non-confrontational is good. I prefer that. Okay, that's it for the nuts and bolts, at least as far as that's really not it for the nuts and bolts at all. That's it for paragraphs one and two, which is the, at the heart of Form 22B for the buyer. Uh, so let's wrap it here okay. for today and then come back in the next video and we're going to talk about the bump period. Let's do it. All right. So with that, if you have any questions on this topic or any other, send an email to me, legalhotline at warealtor.org. Thank you for being a Washington Realtors member.